Okay, we're going to get started. Welcome uh, to this evening of conversation about the future of the city informed by reflections on the past. My name is Elisa Kane. I'm a Vancouver City Planning Commissioner. The VCPC is a body of volunteer citizens appointed by Vancouver City Council to advise them on the future of the city. Before I begin, I wish to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded Aboriginal territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations, on whose territory we work, live, and play. The mandate of the Planning Commission is to advise Mayor and Council on topics relating to the future of the city. We try to ground this future-oriented work in an understanding of the legacy of the past. On a broader level, in our role as conveners of dialogue, we provide and support space for thoughtful conversations about how our city is evolving. These dialogues bring out ideas for what we need to pay attention to as we look to the future to help us make choices that guide our evolution in a direction that leads to a livable, inclusive city. We have a number of other commissioners here this evening. Omar Dominguez, Karen Krangel, Robert Mattis, Jacint Simon, Marnie Tamaki, and our executive director, Yuri Arptis. We also have a number of elected officials. Vancouver City Councilor Pete Fry, our liaison to council, Adrian Carr and Colleen Hardwick, as well as Vancouver School Board Chair Janet Fraser, our liaison to the school board. Are there any other elected officials in the audience that I may have missed that want to make themselves known? Give us a wave. Nope, not here. Their loss. We are truly delighted by the overwhelming interest in this event, and we regret that we were not able to accommodate everyone on the wait list. You know that you are in touch with something that resonates within the community when your event sells out within days of being announced. So for those who were unable to secure a ticket for tonight's event, we are providing a live stream and are recording the event. The video will be posted on the Chronology Program website if you want to watch it again. 2018 was another incredibly busy time in Vancouver for planning and development. Even for us who meet frequently to review what is underway, it is a challenge to keep up with it all, let alone to separate what might be new and significant from what is a continuation of what we've seen before or what is just a flash that will leave no mark. This, this event is an occasion to review the past year's planning and development events and pull out those watershed moments that could change the direction of the city and could qualify for our list of what we call emerging milestones, decisions, actions, or events that could prove to be transformative enough to be added to our online chronology. Tonight's event is being co-presented with SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement. So there are a few housekeeping items before we move on. Please be sure to put your devices in silent mode. The SFU Wi-Fi information should be floating by on the screen at some point if you'd like to connect. And if you would like to tweet tonight, please use our hashtag milestones2018 and our handle at VCPCBC. It's a fun one. Uh, the Twitter details and website links are on the materials that was on your seat when you came in. There'll be no intermission tonight. And again, this event is being video recorded and will be posted online. So if you do not want to appear in the video or have any concerns, please let Yuri know up at the front here, and we will ensure that you do not appear in the final cut. Now, I would like to introduce Councillor Pete Fry, a VCPC City Council liaison, who would like to say a few words of welcome to this event. Thanks, Alyssa. And uh, thank you, everybody, on behalf of Mayor Kennedy Stewart and the entire Vancouver City Council. Uh, really pleased to have you here and welcome. And I can't tell you as a brand new city councillor how excited I am to be the liaison for the VCPC. Um, you know, I'm, people who know me know I'm a bit of a nerd for urban planning, so as soon as I got elected, the first thing I did was ask to be the liaison for this committee. And I'm really, really excited to be here with all of you and with our esteemed panel because uh, I know each of these people and I know they have a lot to offer and talk about. And, you know, as a brand new council, some of the, we've made some really big moves just right away. So a citywide plan, uh, a subway to Broadway, um, rent, enhanced renters protections, all these things are gonna have huge manifestations on how we plan and how we grow our city. And we can't plan for the future without 
looking at where we've come from. So it's why it's so critical to do these check-ins every year and really look at how we're planning and who we're planning for and look at these milestones. So I'm really excited to be here. I'm really excited to find out what we're going to talk about tonight and hear what people have to say. And I don't want to keep talking and bore you because we've got an exciting panel ahead of us. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Really excited. And uh, without further ado, here's Martha. Thank you, Councillor Fry. On behalf of the City Planning Commission Chronology Committee, I would like to take just a few minutes to describe the Chronology Project. I have been involved with the Chronology Project since its inception in 2014, when it started with a course at UBC Sala, which produced the initial research on planning and development uh, over the last few centuries, and created the online timeline. For those of you who have had a chance to look at the timeline, you will note that the first entry is an acknowledgement of the presence of Aboriginal communities in the Lower Mainland for over 10,000 years. The events that are chronicled after that tell the story of post-contact planning and development. However, as the project develops, it is our committee's intention to work with uh, indigenous communities and to add a new section to the timeline which will be an indigenous dimension of Vancouver's planning and development story and we're going to partner with our sister advisory group the Urban Aboriginal Peoples Advisory Committee to do that work. The chronology team includes current and past commissioners and interested volunteers and I'd like to recognize them uh, those who are in the audience. We have commissioners Karen Krangle and Robert Mattis in the front row here. Um, past commissioner Leslie Shea, our past executive director Elizabeth Ballantyne, the current executive director Yuri Artebis, and volunteers Doug Craig, Frankie Mao, Azar Tayabi, and many more. The Chronology Project started with a conversation uh, with a round table of commissioners, both past and present, with the VCPC, who identified a gap in our understanding of the planning legacy of the city of Vancouver. Although there are many interesting histories available, they don't concentrate on the theme of planning and development. So this was taken on as a task by the VCPC. The focus is on milestones. Milestones are a transforming or landmark event, and they are events without which the city would not be the same. So having established some criteria, we have uh, developed a process where we have consulted with a number of people at a workshop in the December, engaged urban thinkers who helped us build a list of milestones, starting with a long list that was created by the committee. And there's also been a survey, uh, which m some of you may have participated in, that looked at the milestones that had been identified and weighed in on whether they were important or not. So uh, through this process, we've created a list of 13 contending milestones that are on your chair. And we gave those milestones to our panelists tonight to help them start thinking about what a year 2018 was and come up with their own impressions of uh, what was important of the year. So these 13 contenders really, uh, interestingly, fall into certain themes. And these are the themes of the past year. Indigenous reconciliation, community planning, and it's, uh, how it is sensitive to local concerns. The uh, aspiration of a city for all that has been endorsed by council and of course, affordable housing. We'll now move on to our panel discussion and I'm delighted to introduce our moderator for the evening, Am Jo Hall. Am is director of the community engagement at SSU's Van City Office of Community Engagement and he's also a fellow um, former planning commission member from 2012 to 2015, Am. Uh, 
Uh, thank you all for uh, being here tonight. Just delighted that you could uh, join us on these important uh, civic uh, conversations and it's wonderful to be invited back as a former uh, planning commission. Uh, the, the, the video for this talk will be available online uh, afterwards uh, as well. Um, we have a number of wonderful uh, panelists here. We're gonna jump right into it and we'll be opening up uh, the floor to questions uh, after we have uh, a bit of a, uh, a discussion to kick things off. I'm going to introduce the panelists to uh, begin with. On the far uh, far side of the stage, uh, Charles Gauthier. He's been the president and CEO of the Downtown Vancouver Business Improvement Association since 1992. In this role, he's been steering the DVBIA with vision and a commitment to the future of downtown Vancouver. He's guided the DVBIA to a legacy of accomplishments and prestigious honors, such as the top year 2000 award for downtown management by the International Downtown Association and for Canadian Society of Association of Executives uh, cornerstone of Excellence Awards in three separate uh, categories. Uh, next to him is Ginger Gosnell Myers of Nishka and Kwakiwak Heritage, and she's passionate about advancing Indigenous rights and knowledge while breaking down barriers between Indigenous peoples and all Canadians. Ginger was the City of Vancouver's first Indigenous Relations Manager for five years, where she was central to advancing Vancouver as the world's first official city of reconciliation and identified opportunities across all city departments for ways that reconciliation can be advanced. And through this, seen over 75 uh, initiatives off the ground. Uh, uh, Ginger is a former co-chair to the Assembly of First Nations National Youth Council, former president of the Urban Native Youth Association, and a founding member of the Circle on Philanthropy and Aboriginal Peoples, and sits as a board of, board of directors for the InSpirit Foundation and a board member for Greenpeace uh, Canada. Uh, as well. Uh, next to her is Carrie Gerwing. She's the manager of community investment at Van City Credit Union. Her work involves partnering with mission-driven organizations to develop community-owned real estate, focusing on affordable spaces in high environmentally performing buildings. She's focused on community land ownership, affordable housing, and not-for-profit real estate development as a means to address growing economic inequality in Canadian cities. And previous to this, she worked at the city of Vancouver uh, as a planner. And uh, sitting right next to me, uh, someone who probably needs no introduction, uh, Libby Davies has been an organizer for, it says 40 plus years here, but I know it's probably closer to 50. You've been at this a long time. As a community organizer in Vancouver's downtown east side, she was elected to Vancouver City Council for five consecutive terms from 1982 to 1993. And afterwards, she was elected as the member of parliament for Vancouver East for six consecutive terms from 1997 to 2015, serving as the NDP house leader from 2003 to 2011 and the deputy leader uh, in 2007 to 2015. And she has a memoir that'll be coming out in a few months uh, as well. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to start uh, by uh, asking Charles to make some introductory uh, remarks here. I wasn't sure where to sit, and <laughs> I thought you might start at either end, so it was a gamble 50-50 here. Um, so I'd like to share some first impressions with you about the 2018 Emerging Milestones. Um, we've heard there are 13 milestones and grouped under four headings, Indigenous uh, Reconciliation, Community Planning, A City for All, and Housing. And uh, as I was reviewing the material in advance of tonight, I was quite impressed with uh, what was accomplished in 2018 or what you've identified as emerging milestones for 2018. And uh, they all deserve to be captured, remembered, and, and celebrated. And I'm gonna add a few more to that list uh, because we were encouraged to do so. Uh, in advance of t uh, tonight, we spent some time in the groom room talking about the, the purpose of this session. And, and I agree, it's really important to look back, reflect, and evaluate uh, what's been done well, and how we got there, and why we did it. And I think the underlying reason for me why we do this is because I think we want to build on that foundation of doing things well in this city. I think we're renowned around the world for urban design and urban planning. Um, I would argue to some extent, I think we've lost our edge, and I think we need to pick that up again. Uh, but I really believe that we need to build on that foundation uh, of creating sound policy and the implementation of a number of actions to carry forward the policy. So let me start with um, what I liked in the list. And I'm going to actually not refer to some of them because I think some of the panelists are going to touch on it 
and they have a lot more expertise in it. But the ones that I focused on, and maybe it's because I have that downtown lens on me, being in the same job for 27 years and enjoying every minute of it, is that um, I really believe that the Northeast Falls Creek official development plan uh, is an emerging milestone um, for a variety of reasons um, listed in the materials you received. I think it's addressing an urban misstep or a mistake. I think it's addressing a wrong that was done back in uh, the 1960s. I really believe it's an opportunity to uh, address that wrong and that um, thought that maybe if we build a freeway that's the answer to uh, the issues that uh, downtown Vancouver was facing in the 1960s and the 1970s. It's an opportunity to create a new neighborhood in close proximity to BC's largest employment center. Uh, but it's also important in terms of connecting, and I'm using quotation marks, the new, this new neighborhood, because it was a neighborhood prior to the freeway or prior to the viaducts being built. Uh, but it's connecting this new neighborhood to the waterfront and other nearby neighborhoods. And I strongly believe that's going to be the impetus to move forward with other transportation changes like what was discussed last week, the Granville Street Bridge. Um, eight lanes, uh, again, part of a freeway network system that was being contemplated at the time. But if we do it right in terms of the Northeast Falls Creek, there's an opportunity to also do things differently with, for example, the Granville Street Bridge. And I also believe that that particular plan is going to be a great impetus uh, to having downtown move from the central business district eastward towards um, what will be the replacement of the viaducts. So I think there's a great opportunity to do additional infill along, along West Georgia, an opportunity to perhaps have our new Vancouver Art Gallery located at Larwell Park, and I think it's a great opportunity in terms of continuing to build on uh, new job space that's required in, in our city. Five minutes goes by quickly. Uh, so why don't I focus on some of the missed milestones? And we had a discussion about this. about this in the green room. I had on my list temporary modular housing units. And the reason I put it on my list for 2018 is, and I looked it up, uh, 600 units were approved on 10 sites across Vancouver as a result of a commitment from the province of $66 million in provincial funding that was announced in the fall of 2017. And it's amazing that 500 of those units were completed and opened by December of 2018. So in a 12-month period, 500 units were constructed and occupied. Um, the other thing I would add to that is um, in December of 2018, the new council uni unanimously voted to find sites for 600 more modular units and to make a request of the province for more funding. So I think this deserves to be on the list of milestones for 2018. And I think even more so because many of you are aware that there was a court challenge uh, to the planning process related to that, uh, in particular to the, the one that was built in my neighborhood of Marple. And that court challenge uh, was not successful by a group called Caring Citizens of Vancouver. And so I think we have uh, something that will be transformative in the city in terms of addressing our homelessness issue. How am I doing for time? I'm done. <laughs> well, maybe I'll get my chance to add a few more later in the, in the conversation. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to pass it on to Ginger. Hey. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, Northeast Falls Creek's a really important milestone, but for me it's a little different um, and really focused in the two milestones that have been addressed, and that is the return of the Cessna Midden to the Musqueam peoples, mm -hmm. and inclusion of indigenous values and design principles in the Heatherlands. And in the future, we're actually gonna see indigenous values and design principles built into both Northeast Falls Creek. They already are reflected in that. It's gonna be built into the neighborhood plan there, also the park, uh, the Jericho lands, uh, some other pieces of property around the city are going to have this indigenous look and feel. And when I worked with the, uh, when I still worked with the city, uh, the Musqueam called it their brand, you know, which is a really neat way of thinking about planning for uh, indigenous inclusion and reflection uh, in the work that we do. Because it's it's a bit of a struggle to look at how to reflect a diverse and not very well known community within a broader city plan. And we have to recognize 
that Vancouver is such a new city. It's incredibly new. I mean, even the, the chronological uh, milestones has only been happening for the last few years. Um, but to Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil this is an ancient place. And we don't know a heck a lot about that. And we are not a city that doesn't care about these things. We really do. We've seen over 70,000 people show up for the Walk for Reconciliation in 2013. We've seen another 50,000 people come out in 2017. Our efforts for Canada 150 was rebranded Canada 150 Plus. We're probably the only place in Canada where celebrating 150 years of Canadian colonialism felt like a really good thing. Um, but uh, I think what we have to remember uh, moving forward is that a lot of this work that we're doing to engage Indigenous communities is quite new. And when we look at some of the um, other cities in the world that have done a really good job incorporating Indigenous values and principles and the identity reflected, like the city of Auckland, they too have only been doing it since 2010. And they've done it with an investment of around $5 million just to kickstart the whole process with an annual investment of $2 million. And then we look at the city of Edmonton and they have, you know, an indigenous department and they have an annual budget of a couple million dollars. Like, not talking about a lot of money here to make sure that the city reflects who we are and who we want to be. And this is also a discussion that we don't have often enough is who do we aspire to become? And I think when we look at a lot of the milestones that you have listed, they not only reflect that, but they challenge us to do something that perhaps hasn't been done by anybody. So I think we have to be really forgiving uh, over the work that is being done in this area over the next number of years. I do see that, you know, there was um, some pushback against the Northeast Falls Creek plan and, and the park. Uh, and that the, probably the only part that really did receive a lot of positivity was around uh, making sure that reconciliation and cultural redress is included. Uh, because there are communities that were literally bulldozed over to make way for those viaducts. And when we look at the Heatherlands and the uh, heritage building, the RCMP heritage building that you know, it, we, we seen a fight, you know, between Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil communities who identified that, you know, the role of the RCMP traditionally was to remove Indigenous children from their families and cart them off to residential schools. And now that they are owners of that property, is that something that they really want to include because it just so happens to be a heritage building that some people also value? And so how do you balance that? You know, reconciliation. Like, we don't quite know what it means, but we feel really good about doing it, and it's providing us an opportunity to be our best selves. Uh, and uh, we're really happy to see that it is being carried out through every single department in the city. So in the future, we're going to see a city that reflects a lot more about who we, who we should have been had colonialism not been so successful. Great. Thank you, Ginger. Kara. Okay, thanks so much for having me tonight. I think to start my comments, I would um, pick out three themes when I looked at the milestones um, that, that were sent and picked by the VCPC. And the first theme that really jumped out at me in um, some of the decisions that I think are really gonna transform the future of our city is the statement that all power comes from the land. So, Land is the, 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 it's the resource, it's the anchor for our communities, but it's also the anchor for this governance institution that we've built that is the city of Vancouver, the municipality, the province. So everything that we've kind of constructed in our imaginations and now keep ourselves really busy operating uh, derives from the land. But more importantly, and to Ginger's point, there's a longer, there's a much longer, deeper seated history um, to this land, and that indigenous perspective is is a real opportunity for us to, um, you know, learn from uh, learn from our indigenous communities about thinking back and thinking forward, and not just thinking back five years ago, but what about five thousand years ago, and what can we learn from what the land was giving us then? So. Why land, how to control it, who controls it, um, is a really important part of uh, um, the decisions that, that we're making that are gonna transform us into the future. 
So I think that there were some, there were some uh, milestones that really have an opportunity for us to redress uh, the power imbalance that has been our legacy uh, post-colonial uh, between citizens, the state, and actually also the flow of financial capital. And yes, I'm from the credit union, so I have to nerd out on the financial pieces here. But um, so from my perspective, the top three milestones were the city's return uh, to the Musqueam uh, nation. Uh, the second is the North Falls Creek and um, uh, the, the reparations, let's call it, back to the Hog Hogan's Alley Society. And then thirdly, uh, the fact that the city designated a portion of uh, its endowment fund to help finance non-market housing. And the reason why those three jumped out at me, and if you think about the theme of all power comes from the land, is uh, the next theme, which is the power of planning and the role of the planner in redistributing power to, uh, to rebalance. Um, and, and, and to try and actually contextualize what we think of as rationality um, determined by the decision makers' power structures. So that's a little bit heady, but what it is is that power actually influences what we see as rational. And in a democratic structure, um, I think it's on planners actually to recognize and, and point out that context. <laughs> So um, some of these decisions, I think, did that in a really meaningful way. So acknowledging that there was a community um, at the at the um, uh, at uh, Union and Gore uh, with the with the Hogan's Alley Society, I think, is a really important acknowledgement of of what was and maybe ought to be again. Um, I think redressing the indigenous lands back to the Musqueam is another uh, another really important opportunity to redistribute power if we believe that all power comes from the land, right? And finally, um, if we think about the role of planners in redistributing power to improve economic to improve economic equality, economic inclusion, to improve uh, and make it feel like Vancouver is a more socially just city, and also that it's a more environmentally sustainable city, um, it then when I was thinking about that, what it led me to realize is that. There's no category addressing climate change, although I'm certain that in 2018, there were some important decisions around uh, green buildings, um, around you know, supporting the green business community to actually get more products and services um, into new markets and the role that the city can play in scaling that to have an important impact on climate change. And then also some of the, some of the role that the city can play around addressing consumption and producing waste. So I was struck by that not being on uh, the milestones and I would encourage us to um, think about how we can actually reflect that even if it wasn't a major decision um, by the city. I think every year the city is taking some really important actions um, around, around trying to uh, galvanize a movement around climate change. And with COP21 being in, in 2018, surely uh, there, were, there, there was something that we could pick pick out of there, that could be a milestone. Let's hope so, because otherwise, you know, by 2030 there won't be any more milestones <laughs> because our planet will be gone. That's depressing. Um, the final point that I was gonna make was, um, so if we think about all power comes from the land and then the role of the planner to redistribute power, then there's an interesting role and um, some themes that came out for me around leadership and the kind of leadership that we're so hungry for uh, within the bureaucracy. So not just the elected leadership, um, with all due respect to uh, mayor and council, but also the leadership that comes from community that can bring a voice to transform decision making, to be like I was saying, more inclusive, more socially just, and more sustainable. And when we get into the conversations, if we want to talk about what some of those leadership qualities are, I've got a nice list here. But just to close my remarks, what I thought um, I would, uh, what I what I thought I would do to close is is to just. Um, celebrate the reframing of the story and the three milestones that I picked out. And that reframing is really telling the story of us, not them. 
And we're so hungry right now for, well, I am anyway, hungry for not what differentiates us from one another, but something that we all hold in common together. And I feel like it, it takes a true leader to galvanize around common interests. Um, not around differences. And I think there's a real opportunity uh, through this conversation about milestones to not just recognize planning decisions, but also the leadership qualities that enabled those planning decisions to be made. And those aren't just the elected leaders, those are also the community leaders uh, and the leaders within the bureaucracy. Um, and so I think we should celebrate those two. Great, thank you, Kara. Libby. Well, thanks very much and hello everybody. And for coming out on an evening where it's a bit chilly out there. <laughs> Thank God you're not in Ottawa or back east somewhere. Um, it's uh, really great to participate in really, I think, what's already a, a great discussion. And Charles, I wanted to say I'm so glad you uh, raised the issue of modular housing because I happen to be at the opening of what I guess is the second to last one now. Uh, there's another 50 or so units to come. And it was just uh, down the street. Um, uh, on the south shore of Falls Creek and adjacent to the Olympic Village. Um, and I too thought, wow, you know, this is a very important milestone. My God, why didn't we do this years and years ago, this modular housing? And the sign said temporary modular housing. And uh, in talking to people, I learned that the housing isn't really temporary. It's actually very solid and structurally very excellent. It's really sort of the locations. Uh, that might move. So that's, that's an interesting concept in and of itself. Um, but I wanted to bring it up because um, standing there, you know, the soul gardens are just on the back side of it. You're looking at the backdrop of the city or the whole city. And it took me back to, um, well, <laughs> I'm going to really date myself here, the 1980s. And thinking about the development of the South Shore of Falls Creek and then the development of the North Shore of Falls Creek right after Expo. And I, I feel like in Vancouver, we've always had this struggle. And the struggle, and Kira, you referred to this uh, in a way, um, the struggle has always been um, between our yearning for community and to be feel like we are a community and that we belong to community and we include people versus what, what back in the 1980s we called the executive city. I don't know if people remember that term, but you know there were elections that were fought and lost on that term, the executive city. And so you know there was a South Shore Falls Creek that was sort of a, a third market housing, a third middle income, and a third social housing. And then there was you know the massive thing of Expo 86 and all what happened after that. And so standing today on the South Shore, looking at the North Shore, and looking at those amazing mountains that you kind of you know, have to look a bit between here and there to get them anymore with the snow on them, what an amazing place we live in. And it, it made me think of that ongoing struggle between what we yearn for and what we want and what seems to happen. And so that took me back to one of the earliest lessons that I learned as a young city councillor, or even before I was city councillor, told to me by Harry Rankin, who some people here might remember, who was a kind of curmudgeonly member of city council. He was sort of like the conscience of council. And I always remember him saying to me, uh, Libby, the, um, the most important power that the city has is the ability to create wealth through zoning. And so that's very akin to what you're say saying here about all power comes from the land, right? I mean, it's also about wealth. And so I, I do look at these milestones. Um, I do find them really concrete and... You know, it's sort of a bit, you know, this happened, that happened. I, I actually look at it slightly differently, more from like what's happened to us as people, what's happened to us as inhabitants in this city. And so I, um, I, I would like to see um, milestones that are also, maybe do talk more about the evolution of change. And um, I'm, I'm thinking, for example, the one that we do have included here, uh, targets set to make Vancouver safe and accessible for all women. I think it would be really good to actually name the report that was adopted by council. And, and, and it's a milestone because, you know, again, thinking back to the 1980s when Vancouver was declared a nuclear weapons-free zone in 1983, maybe, um, 
that was a milestone, and, and it, it, it was connected to a global movement. And I think that the, um, the city report about women and equality and equity is also connected to a global movement about how cities see themselves in terms of gender uh, through women transforming city and, uh, cities, and someone like Ellen Woodsworth, who's done so much work on that, a former city councillor. So I'd, I'd love to see that name more specifically. In terms of the... Um, the milestones. I mean, I couldn't disagree with any of them, but I, I would love to see kind of a different take on it. Like, you know, what are the milestones of the views that we've lost? What are the milestones of the workers who were driven out of this city because they couldn't live here and employers are now struggling to find people to work in various locations? Um, what are the milestones of, of um, you know, what, what we lost? I don't want to sound negative, but what were the lost opportunities? I would add one more specific one, and that is I, I think it's really important to have a milestone about the overdose crisis. And I know some people would argue that that's been ongoing, but I do think there was a milestone in 2018 because City Council adopted a groundbreaking report about what to do to respond to the ongoing crisis and the enormous number of deaths and tragedies that have resulted. And they basically, in that report, called I think for the first time of any city in Canada for a safe supply of drugs, right? This is new. And I was looking back at what the city had done in previous years, starting in 2001, with, the, with what was called the four pillar approach that Donald McPherson and Philip Owen was the mayor. That was groundbreaking. Vancouver has led the way on these things, whether it's nuclear weapons free zones, whether it's um, responding to the drug crisis, whether it's um, women's place in the city, um, and so I, I do feel like the overdose crisis, because that report was adopted by council um, just before Christmas, right, Pete? Um, to me, that was groundbreaking because, you, because yet again, Vancouver is, is looking forward about what we need to do. And I'll tell you, the rest of Canada, as they have with other things to do with um, stopping the criminalization of people who use drugs, is going to look to Vancouver. So I, I would really love to see that included as something that happened in 2018, but it's been a, something that's been moving um, through the last decade. Thanks. Thank you, Libby. I was going to pick up a little bit on uh, what uh, a couple of you said. You know, uh, I'm somebody who's been renovated out of the city before for uh, a couple of years, and this question of um, what are the statistics we keep in terms of our policy making? Like what doesn't enter into the realm of legibility and kind of what are the blind spots that, that happen? And one of the, the decisions the city has made is to go forward around a citywide planning process. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to uh, what are you know, some of the current milestones that could maybe uh, tie into or shape that citywide planning process? What are uh, parts that could be included if we're going to look out five years from now in terms of uh, looking at uh, these milestones and where you would like to see the city go? I wonder if any of you could jump in on that. Uh, so, I mean, I'm going to say some of the things that I'm going to mention might not be around in the next few years. I don't know. Like, we have Pete Fry here. Thank you. I'm really happy that you're here. Uh, because some of these initiatives might not be moving forward. I mean, we're, this is not uh, post-election. Uh, and there's a big change. And change is always incredible uh, and, and, and needed. And so we might see a bit of a rebrand in terms of you know, the Healthy City strategy and the Greenest City strategy. And um, it's probably time to update some of these strategies anyways. But I think when we look at uh, the, map, the larger city plan, uh, it's, it's important to recognize that you know, Healthy City, City of Reconciliation, Greenest City, uh, an inf infrastructure plan, uh, you know, densification versus green space versus you know, like who should be here, who shouldn't. I mean, at the end of the day, this is community building. And we have a lot of people who want to live in Vancouver. Vancouver is an international aspiration for people all over the world. And we want to be welcoming and inclusive. And we have to remember that, you know, it's not just bricks and mortar. It's ensuring that we are reflected, both our identities and our values and the things that we care about and the things that we want to preserve, no matter how you spell it out at the end of the day, those still need to be you know, embedded into that citywide plan. 
Yeah, so just building on that, I was just smirking because um, I remember back when I was in planning school and there was a prof that came in as a guest speaker to our, to our SCARP thing and he said, we, we live, we think, we plan, and then shit happens. <laughs> and I just, uh, you know, when I think about the city plan, I, I'm, I'm actually kind of concerned about it, to be perfectly honest, because um, I find that the planning process, and we were talking about this behind, uh, before we came out here too, the planning process has become more formalized so as to seem more inclusive. And it's become more structured and more controlled. And it, it feels to me anyway, like uh, the planning process has become more of a communications and branding exercise than it really has been around uh, becoming a real community, a community building process. And that, that worries me. And I think the reason why I wanted to draw on the theme of, of, of power redistribution is because planners can either you know, maintain current power structures or they can use the process of planning to redistribute power. And um, there are some decisions from 2018 that I think show little glimmers of hope of, of redistributing power in a way that feels better. But when we talk about a citywide planning process, I worry that that will very quickly distract from those little gems of opportunity to redistribute power by transitioning the ownership of land back to a community group of some sort. And instead say, you know, this is, in, instead kind of re-entrench um, the current context that makes a rational planning process make sense. That's what I'm worried about with the city plan. Um, and so, the, how, so how do you address that then? I think part of how um, the opportunity might be to um, actually give the planning away give it away from the city. Let the municipality actually create the room for the planning to happen, but step away from the actual planning work themselves. That's easy to say um, tonight. It's very hard to do, because what it means is you've got to seed power. You've got to seed power away from a controlled message, and it'll get messy. You know, there'll be fights, there'll be debates, right? It'll be, it'll, it's scary, right? And so rather than lean into what could be a scary exercise. What I'm worried about is that we'll just lean back and say, well, we know how to do it this way, um, uh, but this way will only serve to uh, re-entrench the existing power structures that lead to the kind of wealth that gets generated. That's, that's my worry. Um, well, it's, you know, it's a good question, Em, and um, I, I think of it this way, worst case scenario, we're going to end up with like a gigantic, massive, you know, two volume, three volume report that will definitely be a milestone, but, um, you know, very few people will actually read it. And those few people will probably read it once and then it will kind of like drift off somewhere. Um, so I, I, you know, I feel like it was a political solution to a whole bunch of problems that converged right after the election, to be honest. And so it was kind of a good political solution, but hey, good luck with it. Um, how do you break it down? I, I've always been uh, someone who believes in, in the sort of philosophy of think big, act small like closer to home, right? Like have big ideas, have, have a good analysis overall. So maybe, maybe the plan needs to articulate some of those really big values and big stuff that we want. But then we've immediately got to break it down into very local, close to home. You know, you take your own ownership of it, of the process. Um, otherwise, I think it will unfortunately um, just be a, kind of a monster that keeps growing. And, and, and you'll be like, you know, dealing with it, well, way, way into the future. So I have to be honest, I feel skeptical about it. Um, 
And, uh, you know, I was a big fan of local area planning. We were talking about that too earlier, you know, where you could go and talk to your local area planner and there was a local committee and, you know, stuff happened and it was up and down. We, you know, we had lots of fights on that in the downtown east side. But you know what? We kind of came, we, we cobbled together what needed to be cobbled together. Um, I'm not sure if we would have been able to have done that if it was like a citywide plan. And again, not to... Um start a debate or anything <laughs> up here, but uh, I'm actually looking forward to being involved in uh, participating in the community-wide plan or the city-wide plan. We went through a similar exercise back in 2015. We uh, engaged uh, SFU Public Square uh, to work with our organization to engage citizens in developing a vision for downtown Vancouver to the year 2040. Uh, we did it sort of without the permission of the city, and we wanted to see what people had to say about and what they aspired downtown to look like by that year. And uh, by having handing over the process to SFU Public Square, it would ensure that we were going to listen to others and just our business members. And uh, I get goosebumps every time I reflect on it because as a trained city planner, this was really my first opportunity to engage citizens in part of the process. And over the course of three months, during the summer of 2015, we had 11,000 people who wanted to share what they aspired downtown to look like. So I think to your point, you know, giving up control, giving up ownership without having a preconceived uh, outcome uh, can be extremely powerful. And uh, it changed our organization. Uh, in so many ways, it had an impact on the policies um, and the policy positions we took as an organization. And so because of that, I'm looking forward to the process. I mean, I think it's too soon, um, of course, to say, you know, what is it going to look like? Because I think it's still being uh, shaped. But um, I personally am looking forward to it as a citizen participating in the process. As long as it's really open-ended, as long as it's really an opportunity for me to provide my genuine uh, input on a variety of topics. I was going to ask a question. One of the, the themes that kind of come through when I hear all of you speak is, uh, is sort of uh, how can we redistribute power? How can we get more voices in? And we have an example of uh, something like a business improvement association that gets partially funded through taxes on businesses or property. Uh, could we use the same model to fund residents' associations to participate in a more fulsome way? Uh, because we're, uh, the, the civic and public process relies on a kind of voluntary labor. And I'm wondering if any of you have any ideas to kind of throw out there related to how we can actually, in a very tangible way, redistribute that power in terms of uh, having more voices at the table, in terms of how planning decisions are made. Well, there, there was um, <clears throat> one model um, you know, going quite a ways back, but uh, um, the provincial government at one point uh, set up what were called community resource boards. Does anybody remember that? I think most people here are too young, but they were actually they were actually elected boards. In a, there were thirteen of them in Vancouver, so actually more than there were city councillors, um, and there they were elected to um, help make decisions about distributing social service dollars that came from uh, the provincial government, including health dollars. And I mean, they were eventually done away with, and they were then made into advisory. But the original concept was actually that they would have. Um, again, based on the idea that it was people in that community who would be making decisions, they had certain criteria. But I mean, I do think that there are like a lot of models out there. You know, in uh, in uh, Latin America, they've had all kinds of models about um, participatory democracy with budgeting, right? Um, like open uh, budgeting um, processes where citizen a citizens assembly is actually involved. And we we don't do very well with that in Canada. Um, I think we're sort of suspicious of our own ability to make sound decisions and to have regular folks make those decisions. Um, and I think what we need to do is, um, you know, help uh, train people, educate people, and you know, it's like juries. You know, people generally will make sound, pragmatic decisions when they're given the facts and when they can understand that we need to make our decisions based on evidence. So, I do think the city could you know, experiment with that to some extent, maybe through the planning process, uh, but maybe with other things as well. 
Uh, I think about the urban Indigenous community in East Vancouver and how uh, we had to do some backstepping in the Grandview Woodlands plan to make sure that they were appropriately recognized in that local area plan. Uh, and I see that we have many cultural communities around the city that aren't uh, engaged to the capacity that they should be. If we're looking at uh, devolving power back to the people, uh, we can look around and see that our city doesn't really reflect the people who live here. Like we're a very culturally neutral city and I don't think that's a good thing. And when I think about some of the uh, more, you, you know, like we need to redevelop Little India. I know that work has been, you know, underway and there's been some discussions around that for a little while. You know, like Chinatown, revitalization. You know, there's, there's cultural communities around the city that deserve to be engaged and recognized, uh, and they're not. Uh, that's both a, that's an issue and that's an opportunity. But for uh, East Vancouver and the urban indigenous community specifically, you know, we had to just look at who was already there. You know, and it didn't take a lot of work to just acknowledge that, you know, we have a significant number of organizations that service this population and that there have been a number of housing, uh, housing units built in that neighborhood because of their accessibility to those services. And that over the years, we have this de facto urban indigenous village that has never been baked into any city plan because city planners don't really know who they are and don't know how to talk to them. And when they talk to them, don't know how to actually reflect you know, that back into it. And I think we need to do a better job of doing that with all of our cultural communities, as well as neighborhood houses around the city, because these are the people who live there. And they, like, that is their neighborhood. They know what they want, they know what they need. Um, and, and, and how do we unlock that? I'm, I'm kind of reluctant to, to but I will anyway. Um, <laughs> so I, I actually think the, the, the credit union model is actually an interesting model to um, learn from. So as a member-driven organization um, that has, first of all, committed to reinvesting a certain amount of the profits that we collectively, those of us who are members of the, union, of the, of the credit union, we've collectively agreed that we want to reinvest our profits back into the communities where our members live and work. And, uh, and so we do that in two ways. One is through direct dividends, but the other is through the community investment program where, where I work. And, and it's, it's very interesting because um, playing, uh, playing that role role of, you know, a uh, community investor means that, that I, I have a certain rationality and a certain context and a certain power, if you want to call it that. But so, so you know, I have to, I have to kind of think about my role as, as a, a leader, if you want to call it that, um, to recognize that context and enable communities that might tell me something that I don't want to hear. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think the Hogan's Alley Society is actually a really great example of this. So they were, uh, you know, it's a, it's a nascent group of amazing leaders who, you know, kind of came at, with, with, you know, an, a, a, an amazing vision and an amazing capacity to galvanize around that vision. And uh, there was an opportunity for, for, for us to invest in that group so that they could then bring a voice to city council that I think had a pretty transformative influence on uh, that particular portion of uh, the Northeast Falls Creek plan. Um, and, and so the role of the credit union in giving voice is, is, is an interesting idea, isn't it? And then, you know, the role of the BIAs, I think, Charles, your, your example, it just, it, it's really beautiful because your constituency might be the businesses who, whom you are levying to, uh, to facilitate the, the conversations, but, but their customers are your citizens. And, and so, you know, what I, what I think is interesting about that is um, the role of different institutions uh, in fueling what ultimately can become a really interesting planning conversation if we give it away. So I, I think that, you know, part of it you can always say, you know what the city ought to do is this. But in fact, sometimes it's better if the city doesn't actually do it, but just gets the heck out of the way so that other other organizations can 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 bubble up and, and find their voice. 
Okay, thank you. I think what we're going to do now is uh, open up the uh, floor to uh, questions and comments. And what we'll do is uh, uh, when we go out uh, to the audience, if you could let us know that you want to say something or ask a question, we'll take two questions or comments in a row. And uh, if you have a specific question to a specific panelist, do uh, let us know. And then we'll go back to the audience. We have about 40 minutes uh, or so uh, here. There will be some mics going out into the audience, I think. That's my assumption. Just come up and grab a mic. <laughs> they've, got, they've, got, they've got mics there. Is there anything that you guys wanted to comment on what someone said already on the panel? Anything? Oh, I was just going to actually say, you know, um, it, it was an interesting comment, Charles Run. I don't want to debate. Because <laughs> I, I think that just just to kind of get things going a little bit, I'm I'm actually hungry for debate. I'm I'm I think that you know in an increasingly polarized um, society, the the thing that we shy away from is debate, right? And and because we don't debate, we're not actually getting to the meat of the matter. So I I didn't give um, the enough credence to the affordable housing fund, for example. But it's it's an interesting um, idea. Uh, but it takes a pretty sophisticated financial understanding to um, realize the, the potential of that fund, for example. And that's a very difficult thing to debate in a, in a community meeting, right? So who wants to talk about the role of a fund in land acquisition and how it can stack other capital in a financing structure? Like it's, it's very difficult to, um, to have that conversation um, in, in a sort of general community. But I think that there's a, a really important debate around um, you know, whose capital it is, whose right it is to decide where that capital actually goes and how it gets stacked to leverage other public or private capital to actually deliver on the objectives of the fund itself. That's not something that you know the general public is going to talk about at a, at a Grandview Woodlands local area planning process, but I think it's a really important level of sophistication if we're going to actually break the juggernaut around affordable housing in Vancouver. So where do we get to debate that? I don't know. Sure. Well, I just, I've been uh, listening intently, and this is a really great conversation. I wanted to touch on a couple of things. So, uh, Kira, uh, I can appreciate your cynicism around a citywide planning process. I, I do think that it's a high-level kind of concept, and I think part of the beauty of a citywide pr planning process, as, as we've sort of envisioned it at least, and the various caveats we've added about, about making sure it's inclusive and collaborative and, and, and spatial justice and all these things, is the opportunity to have really just a high-level just overview, just let people dream and let the people of Vancouver sort of share what they feel about the city and, and, then, and then we can drill it down and actually get into the practicalities. But I think one of the challenges in our city, of course, is that too many entrenched powerful groups are resistant to change and, and this is an opportunity to just go really high level with it. And I just also wanted to expand a little bit on the participatory budgeting thing uh, that Libby was mentioning. So yes, it got its start in South America. In fact, uh, New York City has across all the boroughs in like 37 different uh, community neighborhoods, they have a million dollar participatory budgeting each. And each, so each community gets a million dollars to spend. And they have, uh, and this is going on across North America and it's actually growing. Toronto Housing Authority is one of the biggest participatory budgeting groups right now. And uh, what's interesting in a lot of these situations is that they're targeting people, it's not based on ownership or, or even tenure of housing, it's, it's open to people who whoever lays their head in that district. So it includes people who are homeless, it includes children, young people, old people, people who don't have citizenship status, the whole gamut. And they're allowed to talk about what they want to see that money spent on. And it's sort of a discretionary fund that they can then say, well, you know what, we want... And so the, one of the examples that came out of this New York uh, story, so there's the Participatory Budgeting Org, a PB... Anyway, there, there's a really great public education group that has come here to this city because we're piloting a participatory budgeting in the West End for a small amount, just $100,000. But uh, what happened in New York is, is all these people came out and it was in a gentrifying neighborhood in Brooklyn and a woman came out and she's like, you know, I really want to see a dog park. I really want a dog park because, you know, like I'm a dog, blah, 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 blah. And I'm a dog guy, I could appreciate that. But then some, some kids and parents came up and they were like, you know what, we really need our, our washrooms fixed in our public school because the washrooms are falling apart and the plumbing leaks and they're really disgusting. And, 
And so this woman came around completely, dropped the dog park idea, got behind better public washrooms for public schools, and then the city of New York stepped in and said, wait a second, this isn't supposed to be for funding washrooms. We'll pick up the tab for the washrooms, get back to dreaming and imagining what you think would be better. I mean, this is, bit... anyway, I thought it was an interesting story and it's a great opportunity and participatory budgeting, I think, is hopefully something that we can see more of in this city. Thank you. We'll take one more question or comment. I'll get the panel to uh, respond afterwards. There's somebody right here. Oh, there's someone there first. Go ahead. <laughs> so the thing that I'm seeing brought up is just how does the city engage people to provide feedback? So for example, this event, there was a survey. And when I first clicked on that survey, it didn't work. And it was down for whatever reason. But then even through your Eventbrite link, you don't send a follow-up to suggest people complete the survey. And this experience is not just with something as minor as this. It's with the local area plan when I lived in the West End. Oh, there was, suddenly I found out about the local area plan, but when it was complete. And so I think there's an opportunity for the city to engage in different methods of communication with people, whether it be online, through bus ads, really catching people instead of through postcards in their mailboxes and just finding different ways to gather large amounts of feedback and not necessarily engaging, I will, I'll go on. I have a personal issue with these consultations that happen at 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. on a Tuesday when a lot of us are working during that time and so that's a real challenge for us younger folk who are working traditional jobs to engage in these planning processes when the methods of access to them are limited to in-person their times, but also don't provide for that virtual interactive feedback. Great, thank you. Did any of you want to comment on that? Could I comment on that? Uh, I appreciate you bringing that up. So during our, and I'm going to be talking about Reimagine Downtown Vancouver, because we did try to do things differently in terms of how do we engage people. And the advice that we've provided to some of the councillors that we've been talking to about the citywide plan that they're about to embark on is just ensure that there's a variety of ways for people to participate. So with Reimagine, we did have a survey, but we also ensured that we had street teams out there at uh, various different events and festivals. I know the city has pop-up city hall, uh, but finding ways of going where the people are and engaging them in the conversation about what they want downtown to look like by the year 2040. We also had our street teams uh, meet people in lineups for a variety of different uh, festivals and events. So while people were waiting in line, we had our street teams engage them. Uh, they had the choice of either filling out the survey or we used Instagram uh, as a way to kind of get the message out. It was just like, I want downtown to be fill in the blank by the year 2040. So I think there were a lot of great lessons learned that we engaged during Reimagine and we've shared that with council or some of the councillors and we're hoping that some of those innovative ways of engaging people can actually be put in place for the citywide plan. So thanks for bringing that out. I think it's important that we find different ways of engaging people because not everyone goes to an open house. Well, just uh, building on that, <clears throat> um, I think one of the problems, you know, is that we have multiple ways of engaging with people, but it's usually based on the premise that people have to go somewhere else. Um, they have to do something. And so, you know, unless people are really angry about something and they're, like anger really motivates people to do things. I, I don't mean that in a negative way. You know, when, when people get involved in a neighborhood, it's usually because they're fighting against something and, um, and it, it motivates people to get involved. But um, I, I really think that we have to change our view of uh, sort of a participatory democracy and we have to go where people are at, not people, not expect people to come to where we, meaning the decision makers, are at. So for example, if we were talking about citywide planning or any process, uh, why wouldn't we use the workplaces? Like, you know, that doesn't capture everybody, but it captures a lot of people. Why wouldn't we say to employers, like we've got Van City here, we've got the downtown BIA, uh, we've got the Musqueam here, you know, why wouldn't we say, um, you know, can, can you dedicate four hours to your employees out of your work day to have them engage in da 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 da, whatever it might be. You could do the same thing in schools, right? Like with kids, you know, like get the grade sevens or something. Um, 
You could do it in shelters. You, I mean, there's there's many different ways to do it. So I, I really feel like we have to kind of flip it around and go to where people are, rather than somehow expecting people to find out where it is they've got to rush up City Hall or rush over to that committee or to this public meeting or to that zoning, right? Where are people at? Go to where they're at and you'll get them. Yeah, I'd have to say that lack of engagement or limited engagement uh, through the city of Vancouver is probably something that bothered me the most when I was a staff uh, there. And it's not for lack of trying, like the investment in engagement is, is quite minimal in comparison to the scope of the plans that are uh, throughout the city. I really hope that the citywide plan uh, builds in a large and robust engagement strategy with a multitude of options. As, as Libby suggested, there are many ways to reach the people, and there's many ways that the people can be reached. Uh, and more thought, more time, uh, maybe not rush things so much. I know, uh, you know, for the work that I did with the, with local nations and the urban indigenous community, I would always push back against the time frame, saying, no, you can't have this then. Like, the engagement hasn't been done, and you're going to get it when you get it. And if you force me to give you a deliverable, it's not, it's not going to be good, and nobody's going to be happy. And I think that's what we see with a lot of the plans that, that we have is that maybe it wasn't what people hoped it was, and maybe a lot of people weren't happy. So let's invest in engagement. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I guess the only other thing that I would add to this, this conversation about engagement is that um, the questions that get asked really matter. So if the question is, what's your dream for Vancouver? I have a hard time understanding how that's going to land in um, in anything that's going to actually be useful for moving the agenda forward. What I'm more interested in is conversations um, that maybe are framed more around how might we questions. So inviting design thinking into the planning conversation. So how might we build a community that distributes wealth more fairly than what we're seeing now? That would be a good question for the city plan, I think. Uh, so I'm hearing a lot of themes about land being a form of power and that we're trying to redistribute uh, and balance the sort of economic physical portion that's built on top of it with the social fabric, whether or not it's an authentically planned community or it's just a naturally occurring one that uh, planners don't really recognize because the demographics and the economics. So I'm wondering what, um, and for anyone who feels comfortable answering this, uh, what are your thoughts on our new forms of capital ownership, uh, like community land trusts, which separate the land from the actual housing development on top? And we'll take one more question back there, and then we'll come back. A lot of the milestones that are mentioned here seems like things that we're gonna look back on. I really was struck by how you mentioned these are things we want to frame as like, who do we want to be going forward? Um, so we want to recognize these awesome things and these awesome milestones that are progressive. But have you thought about or can you share any milestones that we might want to include that don't shine so nicely for us and maybe are a step that you feel was in the wrong direction and we should acknowledge that and mark it in our history so that moving forward people look back on that and see the impact of that? Great, thank you. Anybody want to? Jump in on those questions? Well, I can jump in on the first one. So it, it's interesting because the, the notion of all power comes from the land is actually the motto for the community land trust movement in the United States. So, <laughs> so uh, we're, I, I mean, Van City is a huge proponent and um, a, a big portion of our community investment program every year is actually in investing in community owned real estate. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, uh, community-owned real estate is, is sort of a proxy for uh, a mission-driven land ownership model rather than a, a, a profit-driven land ownership model. Uh, so, uh, you know, for the last seven years, I have been really inspired by that idea of, um, you know, creating... Like, so, so if, if all power comes from the land and land is the anchor of community and then community actually gets to own and uh, uh, leverage 
the value of that land for their for their aspirations. To me, that's that's a that's a really virtuous idea. And so, uh, to the second question, then, uh, great question, and thank you so much for bringing that up. And it's 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 exactly. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna point at anything in, in specific because I, I just don't feel like I wanna point any fingers tonight. Um, but I do think that there are some really interesting decisions that get made to uh, enable wealth generation in places that are actually breaking down the, the, the fabric of our society. And they're, they're under the ruse of, and I'll give you guys a hint, but uh, they're under the hues of, uh, uh, they're under the ruse of, of bringing beauty to the, the landscape, for example. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so uh, if I understood your question, I, I'm gonna answer it a little bit different. So I identified temporary modular housing as a milestone. Although the outcome was a good one, uh, I think what was the ugly part to it was a level of opposition that it encountered in the first neighborhood that it went into, which was the neighborhood that I live in. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure, I don't know if I would also, I wouldn't want to point fingers or put blame anywhere. I mean, the urgency was high in terms of addressing this issue and prob probably long overdue. Well, not probably, it was long overdue. And I think that it was so quick that the citizens in that particular community, not all of them, but some citizens kind of reacted in the way that, uh, out of fear of the unknown and that it was happening in their own backyard. Um, so I think that that for me was sort of the, the dark side or the, the, be, the bad part of that, although I think the outcome was positive in terms of addressing the issue of uh, providing homes for people. So, but I would say there is a dark side to that. And I think that it, it really talks about, I think, the, the time that's required to bring people up to speed about what these are. Uh, I think there's more time to educate, make people aware of what this is about, and spend time addressing their concerns. But then you balance that with the urgency of the issue, which was to provide the homes for the people, the homeless people, as quickly as possible. So I still consider it a milestone, but maybe we could have done it differently. Um, I think sometimes we're not we, we're not as good as we should be on follow-up on things that we do. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of community land trusts, of co-ops, um, but we often don't provide the resources that allow these kinds of models to be sustained. Uh, for example, right now in the city, there's a, a bit of an issue that's developing about the lease renewals for co-ops that are on city land. And, you know, we sure don't want to get down to the wire where it's like a mad scramble. Um, <clears throat> and co-ops generally are a great model, but they actually need to have built-in resources to allow the model to be sustained um, so that people, you know, it's like the daycare centers, right, with parent participation. So what do the parents do? They're washing out toilets, you know, or doing stuff like this. Because, so we can't have great ideas. Of, of what we think can happen in our city and not sustain it in a way that's giving people resources um, that allows for you know, distribution of labor or, or, or to have a process that's ongoing. And so I, I do worry about that and I think when, whatever comes out of the city plan, um, if there are new models of participation or whether it's like more co-ops, like you know, whatever it might be, we've got to build in um, the, the process and the resources that allow people to remain engaged and not feel they just got left holding the bag. And then all of a sudden it becomes a big problem. And they're like, well, why the hell do we do this in the first place? This is just like more work, right? And so I, somehow we've got to strike the right balance. Thank you. We've got time for a few more questions here. <clears throat> Uh, it's just a comment. Uh, Lily was mentioning and, and highlighting uh, the, uh, the, op the opioid crisis and the fact that there were um, important measures that happened uh, recently. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't enthusiastically um, mention those measures because we're still at 120 uh, deaths per month. And even if we go to 80, deaths per month. It's, it's an absurd number, I mean, if we think about it. Um, those measures are uh, towards the individuals that are addicted. 
but I haven't seen, for example, measures towards uh, high school students or even talks at universities because that's where we need to go to, to stop these deaths, right? So it's, it's, it seems that um, uh, we're dealing, we're trying to deal and then we don't wanna, we wanna look away from it. But we can't do that. We have to uh, uh, look at the whole society. Yeah, and I think it's important to, to recognize that uh, we have a city going beyond its normal scope of governing powers in order to address an issue that is vitally important to people's safety and lives. And that spreads across the opioid crisis to the housing crisis. Housing, again, is not a municipal government uh, power or authority. You know, like we don't have money to build housing because it traditionally wasn't, uh, you know, the responsibility of the city to take care of these things, but Vancouver has. And I think when we look at the milestones that we have for 2018, those could be seen in some part as cities going above and beyond its normal power structure to take on issues that aren't being addressed by the province or the federal government. And so, you know, like, where are the other levels of government? Who else is taking a leadership role? You know, the city can't do everything. And uh, it, it's very easy to look to the city to solve all of these issues because they are the government closest to you. Like, we're not going, we can't walk to Victoria and we can't walk to Ottawa to talk to our government reps about the issues that are happening in our community. So we de facto walk to City Hall because we know the people there and it's a way to have our voices heard. And in turn, we see them responding and that's good, but it's not necessarily you know, at the fault for not doing everything. I think we're getting there. If I could, if I could just add to that, I think that's a really relevant and valid point. And I think it raises the whole notion that um, the emergence of cities globally as the place where our global problems are actually going to be solved, as opposed to necessarily from, you know, international, national, it, you know, it comes back home. And we've seen that with almost every issue, and now we're seeing it with climate change. I mean, we only have to look to the south of the border, right, where everything is going backwards, but where there is movement forwards, it's actually in the local jurisdictions. And I think this is actually a global ph phenomena as cities become, um, they, they have the least amount of power in a constitutional sense, but they have the most amount of power in terms of their ability to harness people's energy and, and motivation to change. Um, and, and I think that's true in our city. I mean, I, I kind of feel like though the elephant in the room is that we still have a city council of 11 people, you know, I mean, which has been since 1936 or something. So, you know, even, even our governance structure here is so outdated. Um, but nevertheless, the city is still plowing ahead. And I, I feel tremendously proud of that. I mean, I really do. I mean, I, I really feel like there's so much that is, whether you look at the, um, the overdose crisis, whether you look at housing, whether you look at climate change, whether you look at peace, uh, development, you know, it's actually come from the local jurisdiction, right? And, and so how do we, you know, how do we affirm that? And, and, you know, so we're not always having to run, you know, having someone who was in Ottawa and knowing how difficult it is to get change at that level. This is where it's happening, is in the local community. Hence, hence the, one of the themes that I picked out, which is the role that leaders can play in redistributing power, right? So there's a, there's a really important opportunity, I think, and maybe, maybe you know, my less cynical self says through the, the, the citywide planning process, Pete, we can, we can actually find those leaders who can galvanize around a vision where, you know, we, we surround ourselves with people who want to see us flourish. And then as leaders, they'll speak up. They'll have courage. They'll they'll show compassion for 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 others in a way that that we're not seeing right now at different levels. And and with that kind of with 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 that kind of empowerment with with leaders, not just elected leaders, but leaders from our community, we can bring that kind of conversation forward to say, if you're not going to do it, like my dad used to tell me, lead 
follow or get out of the way. We've got time for some more. We've got a question back there. Uh, thank you very much to all of you for your uh, thoughts tonight. My question, um, back here, sorry. My, my question kind of touches on um, the community engagement issue and how to best kind of go about it because, and Ginger kind of talked about the different groups there are, the, the cultural groups or those groups who for one reason or another over the course of history haven't been in positions of power or haven't been able to access power. You know, when we think of Chinatown or we think of Little Italy or we think of Little India, these are kind of places we can actually point to and say, okay, there's maybe an official body we can go to to actually hear from them on how we can best serve them or what they need in their community. But do any of you have an idea of how we can go to those communities? Because I live in a city out in the valley that's kind of just starting on its journey of actually engaging with different community groups and different neighborhoods. How, how do we go about best identifying those groups of people who might not have had representation or might not be represented by a community association to actually start to engage with them and listen to them because there's new cultural communities that are growing in Vancouver. There's new groups of people who need to maybe participate or be able to participate in the democratic process or what have you. So how do we go about actually identifying these groups? How can we better kind of give them a voice, give them a representation in a community association or what have you? So we'll take one more question back there and then we'll come back to the panel. There's one right there, I think, yeah. Hi, thanks so much for this amazing conversation. It's been great. Um, I actually just wanted to further the discussion we were, that just occurred before this question here about um, the redistribution of power to the local level and wondering if the panelists have any ideas about how to resource that power. Like, how do we get the provinces and the, and the federal government to actually hand over some cash because we can't, you know, all the leaders, in, you know, all the community leaders in the world can get together and, with, with enthusiasm, but, you know, as, like Libby, you were saying about resourcing, um, it's so important. So, yeah, I'd like to hear your ideas on that. Yeah, actually, sorry, I'll take that one more question right there since you're waiting and we'll come back to the panel. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I was thinking about the idea of having these very local like community councils and it kind of, it really worried me because as someone who's new to the city, it just seems like there's a lot of this nimbyism and these communities that don't want change in their neighborhoods. It's like pretty evident in the built form of the city when the majority of the city is single family housing that is completely unaffordable for people my age and around my age, I'm 23 and I just graduated. I just volunteered at a hackathon, NW Hacks, and I was speaking with a lot of the students there, and I'm speaking with other colleagues who are fresh out of university and are just starting. And we want to live in Vancouver, but between rent and just the compensation in the city, it just feels like we're a generation that's left behind because we're working really hard and just compare, we're comparing it to like how our parents had it and to a lot of people who already have housing and own land in the city, like, is there going to be, like, how do you engage people who aren't living in those communities but want to live in those communities, essentially, is what I'm getting at. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I think your question aligns with the first gentleman who asked, how can we engage diverse communities? And I talked about cultural communities, and I mean, my easy solution is, well, hire liaisons. Like you need to have people who look like you and who are part of the community that you're a part of uh, in City Hall as a staff resource who can connect with all the departments and all the projects that are there. Like you can't rely on volunteer community uh, people to, to just step up and always be that voice. And like, are you really gonna get them to edit community plans, like no, you need to have actual hired staff uh, and the city can do that, it hasn't. And it kind of ties into you know, nimbyism and reflecting the voice of our younger generation because the city actually had a, a planner for young people, it was a youth planner, maybe 15, 20 years ago, it isn't around anymore. It felt like such a missed opportunity to hear the voice of the next generation of Vancouverites. That's really missing in this discussion. And when I look out into this crowd, I mean, you're a pretty young crowd. 
You're not the normal crew that shows up to city events to talk about planning or policy, and I think that's amazing. And also, uh, we're not just talking about affordable housing, we're talking about a whole host of issues that affect community living. And maybe, maybe there's um, you know, a connection between you know, showing up to an event that you can talk about anything that's important to you versus showing up to an event where you're gonna be confronted with you know, NIMBYs who are gonna be aggressive and you know, push back. Like, we actually wanna create spaces that promote conversations and aren't just debates and irrational you know, shouting matches. Uh, but we really need to create space for our young people. It's missing. It should be reflected in all of the city plans that we have. Yeah, I don't disagree with that, although I have to say that it does make me a little bit nervous when I think about hiring um, community liaisons. If those community liaisons are, you know, rational planners as opposed to community developers. So I think that there's a really important skill set that, that you need to have to, to find those, those communities within your community. And one of those skill sets, I think, building on a point that Libby made previously, is somebody who's willing to go out there and beat the pavement. Look over, look over your neighbor's fence and say, hey, how's it going? What's going on for you these days? Like, those kinds of conversations aren't something that I actually see planners engage, the, that's not the kind of conversation that I feel like planners are, are having these days. So I think it takes a, a unique individual to, um, you know, to be able to go out there and, and, and say, I see you and I value, I believe in your fundamental right to flourish. How might we create an opportunity for you to flourish. That's quite a, that's quite a skillful uh, conversation for somebody to have, and I think it's an important one. So, um, but, but to your point um, uh, about you know, how, how do we get the voice of people who aren't there right now, and my mind goes to a few different places. So one, yes, we can create planning processes that are more inclusive and engaging and meets people where they're at. That's one way of doing it. But what I, um, what I'm really interested in, what I was trying to talk about a little bit before, is is the 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 the, the leaders in your generation who say, you know what, if you're not going to do it for me, I'm going to do it for myself, and um, and and come up with interesting models. So be be an entrepreneur, right? So so what is an entrepreneur? It's somebody who has a vision, and no matter what amount of resources they have available to them, they will realize that vision. They're like a dog with a bone, right? So if you really want it, um, I think there are, there are ways to get it that might not be inside of a formalized planning process, but there are, you know, uh, like your, your credit union uh, might, might wanna have a conversation about how to fuel um, your generation's hunger to, um, to, to find a place in this city. I think there are some really interesting, creative, entrepreneurial opportunities for you to step up as a leader. Um, so it's co sort of you know coming back to the lead. So don't follow, lead, right? I find it, I don't have answers to your questions, but what I find interesting is that we were gathered here tonight to talk about the milestones of 2018. And I would say that most of the discussion or the questions and the comments are about how do, you, how do you get us engaged? How do we engage you in the future of the city? Which I, I find this very interesting. And it's all about engagement, the plan, and uh, you know, how do you get more involved? So I'm, that's my takeaway, is that, and to Councillor Fry, who's here, um, is that it, there's a, a group of people that are craving to be engaged in the next process and the next generation of what the city's gonna become. I don't know if um, the Vancouver City Planning Commission thinks about milestones you'd like to see for next year, but uh, if you do, um, maybe this is one that you could put on your list um, for the city to think about uh, developing new models of engagement. Um, I mean, I think there's been some great ideas, and I, just in response to what's been said, I would come back to my earlier point is, and that is, Let's go to where people already are, your workplace, um, your schools, your faith centers, your senior center, um, and not expect people to show up elsewhere. 
Um, I think also the more we decentralize uh, and make it local is, is good. And then the last point I would make is that, you know, there's a whole movement out there that we don't necessarily pick up here, but, you know, popular education movement, right? I mean, there are all kinds of models that have been well established around the world um, that are based on popular education of engaging people that are, that are bottom up, right? That aren't controlled, um, that are open. And so, like, we, we actually don't need to reinvent uh, oh, oh, sorry, invent stuff. It's actually out there. We just have to go grab some of these models and figure out what wor what will work in our city, or it might be a variety of things. So I I've always felt that, you know, generally speaking, you know, people know what they want. If you sit down with a group of people, they will absolutely tell you what they want, what they need, what, you know. The hard part is knowing how, is the how, how to get it. Right, and that's where the resources and the sustainability has to come in. And I think that's where the city has to really, um, you know, be an ally with people, um, not control it, but to give people those resources. We, we know what we need to do. Every single one of us in this room, we know what we need in this city. It's how do we do it, right? How do we interact with each other? How do we build that trust and the relationships that we need to develop, even with our adversaries? Right? Very important thing to think about. How do we engage our adversaries, right? I think somebody made the point earlier that so much today is, is about you know, them and us and oppositional. And so learning how to engage our adversaries in a respectful way and breaking down some of those barriers is, is also very much a part of, of community engagement. I'm going to take uh, two final questions or comments. I have Andy Yan back there, and I have Javier Campos here. And I'll get the panel to wrap up after that, and the planning commission will be up. Go ahead. Andy? Is there well, a sure, I can use this. Let's do the old fashioned way. Um, a question to the entire panel. Thank you so much for a very thoughtful panel here. And I think it's kind of building a comment that you started with me for next year. But I'm really curious about how you might be able to think about milestones. And, you know, and for now, this is a question to the entire panel, and perhaps in a wrap, as a wrap-up question is, so it's 2025. What do you think the milestones in 2020, 2025 Vancouver could be, might be, should be? Don't answer that just yet. Thank you, again, reiterating the good discussion. But uh, my, my question is more of a comment, I guess, on something I've been thinking about. So this discussion, although we've been talking a lot about engagement and community engagement, and the question about what happens with NIMBYism and all that, and I think I do understand giving power to the neighborhoods, which is incredibly important, but the city has another role, which is to distribute certain things along the city. And I think one of the things we've been talking about, and we talked about modular housing, and we talked also about the citywide plan, which is a way that things become diffused around the city, which wasn't something that used to happen in Vancouver. And we, we also have it with the whole duplex zoning that's going across the whole city. And it's not, oh, here is this area, you know, you know we've concentrated all the social services down here. And it sucked them all out, and everybody said, well, screw you, I don't want them in my neighborhood, right? They're out of here. And so this is an incredibly bold step to take to put the modular housing all over the city, right? And, it's in, and to do this duplex zoning all across the city so that maybe the money will go where it should go and not where the city does this kind of like, oh, we're going to develop wealth right here. We're going to let something else happen. And so the city does have a role to play in making sure that this gets distributed across the city and then the engagement groups can then do something with that that they have to take responsibility for. But for me, the milestone is this idea that the city's kind of growing up on itself and looking at itself in a holistic way and no longer these sort of more self-interested neighborhoods and allowing that to go on. And that's a very important part of 2018 and uh, these two initiatives and hopefully more citywide initiatives. And that, you know, I want to know what the panel has to say about that and that kind of renewed consciousness. Let's go two minutes wrap up each. Um. Look, I think we have to learn from our First Nations, Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil to, to both Andy's question and your, your question around NIMBYism. Like, in 2025, I hope a milestone is 
MST Development Corporation officially becomes the largest landowner in the city of Vancouver, topping the land owned by the city of Vancouver, who is right now the biggest landowner. Uh, why is that important? Because uh, MST DC are buying back land at market value. They're going to be developing it at a leasehold. They're not selling it because their whole premise is to get their lands back. Lands that were stolen, these are unceded homelands. They've never had an opportunity to benefit from the wealth that everybody else has created. I hope that by 2050, they are all billionaires and that they are the richest people in all of this country because they deserve to be, because everybody else has become uh, rich off of the wealth that was stolen from them. Where does this tie back to NIMBYism and where we can grow social consciousness? Who are the first people, who are the first landowners to step up and offer their lands for uh, temporary modular housing? Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, they offered up their lands at the Marpole site. They want to offer up their lands at the Jericho site as well. And any other lands that they open up, you're going to be sure that they will say, yes, we will do what we can to ensure that people in this land, in their homelands, are housed and taken care of. The people who have the most, who have lost the most, are the people who are paying. Uh, maybe they shouldn't be. Like maybe they should just be getting this uh, through through land claims, but they're not. They're paying and then they're sharing. The first to share. So mine's pretty straightforward, Andy. By 2025, well, it's not that straightforward, a variety of housing types for all incomes throughout the city. And the reason I picked that, I'm glad you picked that date as well. Um, I didn't get to do this in my introductory remarks, but currently there's 11 brand new office buildings being built downtown uh, that will add 3 million square feet of job space by the year 2024 and uh, anticipated 20,000 new employees working in those buildings. Where are we gonna house them? And so I think we need to strive towards that milestone of increasing our housing supply for all income types or all income levels and all types of housing throughout the city of Vancouver. So that's my milestone. In 2026, we look back and say we've achieved that. Um, I've got two that come to my mind. One is building off of what Ginger was suggesting around um, land repatriation. And uh, so it, it's a milestone around the property endowment fund that it actually gets divested and taken off of the books of the city of Vancouver and actually formalized in its own nonprofit mission-driven organization that has a role to play in, um, uh, you know, furthering the redress uh, for with our with um, our indigenous um, with our indigenous communities but also um, uh, you know giving an opportunity for you know the young entrepreneurs who want to uh, come up with new ownership models to have an opportunity to do that not necessarily on the land but um, not owning the land, but owning the building that can get built on the land. So that would be kind of exciting. So I think, you know, some kind of uh, uh, disinvestment of the property endowment from, from the city of Vancouver's books in six years, maybe that could be possible. So I think that's one milestone that I'd like to see. The other, uh, coming back to what I, what, I, what I wanted to note about what's missing from the milestones in 2018, I think it would be really interesting and possible uh, by 2025 for the city of Vancouver, uh, maybe as an output of the citywide plan to have every citizen of Vancouver commit to one planet living. Uh, well, it's a tough question, but I just wanted to come back to a question we didn't respond to, which was about the city's powers. Um, and I think it's a really major question that you raised. Um, you know, this is where stuff's happening, but we have the least amount of power. And I, I, I don't quite know how this will be tackled, but possibly um, I do have a lot of hope in this city council that we have because it is a very interesting mix of people um, and that possibly by working with other municipalities uh, within BC but even nationally that they might be able to um, energize a, a conversation around 
uh, the powers of municipalities. Like Vancouver has a city charter. We're the only one in BC that does that. All the others are under the Municipal Act. So we do have a uniqueness and maybe we need to start bugging the provincial government about that in terms of expanding the powers that Vancouver has to deal with some of the issues we're facing. And in terms of 2025, um, I mean, I, I, I think it needs to be said that um, you know, the overriding issue on everything is climate change and the International Panel Report, I forget what the acronym is, but what, what did they say, it was 15 years? I mean, so I hope by 2025, you know, we've got to be halfway to meeting those goals, otherwise we're done for. So again, Vancouver's role in that, not only as a city, but nationally, is, is going to be very important. And then lastly, I would say um, that I really hope by that time, the overdose crisis um, is something that we look back on and say, you know, that we responded to that because it was a crisis, you know, and that we, we just don't let it go on and on and on and more and more people die. Uh, to me, that's a very basic thing about our city, and, and we have to, you know, we have to get on it as soon as we can. Charles, Ginger, Kira, Libby, thank you so much for uh, sharing your thoughts. Okay. And, uh, I'd like to uh, I'd like to invite up Robert Matus from the Vancouver City Planning Commission for some closing thoughts. What an incredible, rich discussion. I, um, I brought some paper to make a few notes when I was listening to you, and I just kept turning the pages, filling them up uh, w with different ideas. And not only the missing gaps th that we had, uh, but also how forward-looking uh, th that you all have been, uh, and, and suggested a, a different lens to look at the milestones, uh, to, to maybe reframe them in a different way. We, we have a meeting. Uh, of the committee later this week, if uh, anyone wants to come, <laughs> if you haven't had enough. <laughs> you might not be into committee work. Uh, but but, but uh, what, what the, hopefully uh, the wisdom of the room will be um, put together in a report. We report to council, uh, provided advice to council through the planning commission. Uh, and uh, along with the message, of, of, of looking to the future and, and, and different ways to, to tackle these problems uh, will be very much the idea that, that whatever decisions are made should be firmly grounded in the legacies of the past, in, in the milestones uh, that, that we have collected and, and the, uh, the groundbreaking work that has already been done. Uh, it, it, the way we see it, it is uh, the message is, is don't change lanes without checking the rear view mirror. Uh, just know what's coming behind you before you go ahead. Uh, we, we will bring your perspective also to the online chronology, uh, which hopefully uh, you, everyone here has had a chance to see. Uh, and this will add the, the next year to the chronology. Once we've uh, completed within the next few weeks, hopefully uh, next month, uh, and bring it up to date. The chronology is, is very much a collaborative er effort uh, we began working on it four or five years ago. There's probably over 100 people at, at different stages that, that have contributed to it. Uh, we certainly look forward to a, a, as much uh, involvement as, as we can get. Anyone who is interested is invited to uh, speak to myself or, or to Yuri or to anyone on the commission and let us know. And uh, we'll, we'll keep you informed on what we're doing. Uh, and uh, you're more than welcome to, to come out and continue discussions like this uh, that we have. Uh, and uh, the, um, we're, we'll also, uh, a year from now, be working on our uh, fifth annual uh, year in review, uh, looking at the milestones and what Council has done over the past few months. I want to thank our partners again from the SFU uh, Community Engagement Office uh, for, for uh, doing this and the fantastic volunteers uh, that, that put this event together, both uh, on the commission and um, from the community. And I especially want to thank all the audience for coming out. Uh, it, it's the involvement of the community that, that the chronology uh, really pushes it forward. 
uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much again for coming out.